Today we'll hear about risks that don't result directly from ecological upheaval, but stem from failing to keep up with the global energy transition. Market transitions can be held back by outside influence and then occur suddenly as economic shocks. These are potential costs of the fossil fuel funded campaign of denial, delay and obstruction, holding back the transition and then having it occur anyway in a sudden collapse. In other hearings, the operative term was systemic risk when losses in one sector cascade out through the economic system. Here, the issue is that the world is moving away from oil and gas, but truculent and politically connected market actors persist in fossil fuel investments, which then crash in value when their unsustainable economics overwhelms the artificial politics that supported them. The operative term of today's hearing is therefore stranded assets. The prospect of investments in fossil fuels becoming relatively worthless when there is no one to buy the dirty product may sound like a far-off possibility. But for the United States, the world's largest producer of oil and gas, it could be just around the corner. Why is that? That's because Saudi Arabia and pretty much everyone else in OPEC can produce oil far more cheaply and thus can sell it at a lower price point than the United States. If there is ever a rush for the exits, they can sell at cost and price us out of the market. For now, prices are propped up by the cartel. But just like a run on a bank, when a major supplier loses confidence in the cartel and drops prices to cost, things will change in a hurry. The present artificial market cannot last forever. There are too many externalities looming. Even fossil fuel companies talk about the inevitability of reaching peak oil or the point at which maximum oil demand is reached, followed by an irreversible decline. How does that decline come? Is it slowly up and then slowly down the other side of the peak? Likely not. The International Energy Agency notes that as soon as it becomes clear that oil demand is going to decline, it will be in the economic interest of these lower cost producers to flood the market at prices just above their marginal cost of production. That shift could be fast. When it happens, all the assets producing more expensive, less competitive fossil fuels stateside can't compete with the lower price, and they become worthless, stranded. The market for American oil dries up fast. Our witnesses estimate that stranded U.S. fossil fuel assets could total $397 billion. Globally, the losses could total $1.4 trillion. This is what is known as the carbon bubble. Similar to the systemic risks that rising seas, flooding, and wildfires pose to the housing, insurance, and mortgage markets, a mass stranding of fossil fuel assets could also lead to large economic shocks that reverberate across the broader economy with real consequences for the federal budget. And as we will hear today, peak oil is on the horizon. As Putin's brutal invasion of Ukraine reminded the world, foreign energy from petrocrats often comes with strings attached. It's in the national self-interest of every single fossil fuel importer from the EU to China to exit the volatile and expensive oil and gas market as soon as they can especially when more solid energy security can be found in the form of renewables, EVs, and other low-carbon technologies. In the same way that a carbon bubble bursting hits the United States particularly hard, within the United States, certain states will be hit particularly hard. States heavily dependent on fossil revenue sources, as one of our witnesses will elaborate. Preparing for that day by those who represent those states is elementary prudence. If we want to avoid the worst economic disruptions of a carbon bubble, we need an or orderly transition to zero carbon energy. An orderly transition requires policies to smooth the change, precisely the policies the fossil fuel industry has spent over three decades fighting. Every day that industry uses political power to hold back progress, more water backs up behind the dam making the downstream catastrophe more damaging when the grim day arrives. Orderly versus disorderly transition has grave ramifications. Our choice is clear. We can plan for the future and try to minimize the economic damages associated with stranded assets, or we can just keep plowing ahead and hope that all the evidence is wrong.
Just as the scientists haven't been wrong about climate change, something tells me the economists are not likely to be wrong about the economic fallout. Ranking Member Grassley. I had the honor of serving Iowa in the Senate for four decades. Uh, I've been chairman of the Finance and Judiciary Committee, so I know what it is to be chairman of a committee, and uh, I'm honored to serve with you on this committee as uh, your chairman and I'm ranking member. I've seen plenty of problems facing our nation, and most were resolved through bipartisanship. And bipartisanship is going to be really, really necessary if we're ever going to crawl out of our deep fiscal hole that we're in right now. Every week since becoming ranking member, I've tried to focus the conversation on America's fiscal problems. We're facing public debt, then in a few years we'll surpass record levels set in the wake of World War II. But five of our first six hearings this Congress have been about climate change. We've discussed sea level rise, hurricanes, wildfires, and the state of the insurance industry. Climate change is always worth discussing and must be discussed. It should be on everybody's agenda. But more immediate threat within this committee's jurisdiction needs to be addressed. The United States is barreling towards a fiscal crisis. We've been on an unsustainable fiscal path for decades, and, and that's under both Republican and Democrat. And bipartisan pandemic spending accelerated our journey to this fiscal cliff that we're facing. In times of national crisis, the federal government must be able to respond with emergency spending. But once the crisis subsides, Congress must tighten its belt to put debt and deficit on a sustainable, manageable path. Unfortunately, the exact opposite approach was taken the past two years. Despite an economy well on its way to recovery, the Democrats who control the entire government, all three branches, or all three political branches, chose to go on a multi-trillion dollar bipartisan or partisan spending binge. Prominent economists from previous Democrat administrations sounded a warning alarm. We had Larry Summers and Jason Furman being the most prominent speaking out. They correctly warned that the Biden administration partisan spending spree would have consequences. Those consequences are now coming to a head. Decades high inflation is proving difficult to stamp out. Rapidly rising interest rates are taking a toll on our economy, almost visible on our financial system. Several banks have found themselves flat-footed, holding on to older, low-interest government bonds that nobody wants uh, uh, to take in. Uh, the Fed finds itself behind the eight ball. Further rate hikes are probably necessary to tame inflation. But doing so will put more stress on our financial system and the broader economy. And yet, President Biden and too many in Congress refuse to acknowledge that everyone knows to be true that our debt and deficits are unsustainable at unsustainable levels. We can no longer kick the can down the road. President Biden, I want to tell you for the good of the country, you must show presidential leadership. No more playing politics. A good first step would be to engage Speaker McCarthy in bipartisan talks to raise the debt limit and lay the groundwork for fiscal discipline moving forward. This committee should also be engaged. Let's have a serious and frank discussion about our dire fiscal situations. Let's hold bipartisan hearings with respected economists and policy experts from both sides of the aisle. Let's examine our finances and find solutions. So let me be clear. I support an all of the above approach to energy production. The majority of Iowa's energy comes from wind. I've been credited with creating the wind energy tax credit. 
We get 60% of our electricity today from wind, and in a four, three or four day or three or four years, that'll be 80%. I re -sport, re, uh, support renewable technologies before uh, be, becoming more and more competitive. I hope uh, 30 years ago when I got the wind energy uh, tax credit passed, I was uh, 10 or 15 years ahead of any discussion of uh, climate change at that time. So I don't think I have to take a back seat to anybody doing what we can to fight uh, global warming. Now we have oil and gas is clearly dominant in the United States energy sector. The reality is that fossil fuels account for 79% of U.S. energy consumption. It's naive to think that an energy transition will happen even in 10 years or that markets won't be able to keep up. Environmentalists blocking the permitting of new energy and mining projects will cause further delay. And for the United States to, uh, could, to uh, change to renewables is entirely proper. But when you think about how the third world nations are dependent upon uh, cheap energy, and if we want to help them get out of the poverty hole that they're in, we're doing an injustice to them if we believe in that. Besides, we seem to be backing up the use of child labor in the Congo when we get lithium out of the Congo for our uh, batteries, for our cars. So we need diversity to maintain energy security, and energy security is, of course, national security. Even President Biden understands that we're going we're going to need fossil fuels well into the foreseeable future. So, Mr. Chairman, you've made your message on climate change loud and clear, but let's also focus on the immediate threats that square, squarely within this committee's jurisdiction. I thank you very much for listening to me. Well, I always listen to you, and I would uh, simply say that it, my idea of a good first step would be for the speaker to lay out what his actual plan is and maybe even try a vote on it. My experience is that in a democracy, secrets from the public are usually a bad idea, and if it's a bunch of bad ideas that are the secret, then that makes it a worse idea. So let's see what uh, Speaker McCarthy's plan is with specifics, and we'll get going. Yeah. Um, our witnesses today are uh, Claudio Gallimberti, the Senior Vice President and North American Research Director of Rystad Energy, a leading energy consultancy where he oversees their analysis of global oil demand. He has worked in the energy industry for over 20 years. We thank him for his testimony. Next, we will have Dr. Gregor Semenyuk, who is an assistant research professor at the Political Economy Research Institute and the Department of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is expert on the economic risks posed by stranded assets and has consulted for the United Nations Environment Program, the European Commission, and the UK government. We look forward to his testimony. Daniel Ramey is a fellow and the director of the Equity in the Energy Transition Initiative at Resources for the Future, as well as a lecturer at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. His work covers a wide range of energy policy issues with a particular focus on tools that can enable an equitable energy transition for communities dependent on the fossil fuel economy. We're glad to have your testimony also, sir. Next is Dr. Benjamin Zeicher, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He was formerly a senior fellow at the Pacific Research Institute and the Manhattan Institute an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, a senior economist at the RAND Corporation, and a senior staff economist on the Council of Economic Advisors. Finally, we have Lucien Pugliarisi, the president of the Energy Policy Research Foundation. He previously served at the National Security Council under President Reagan and in roles at the Departments of State, Energy, Interior, and EPA. We welcome him back to the Senate. The last time I think he was uh, testifying in the Senate, it was at the Environment and Public Works Committee, 
where he came to testify in opposition to renewable fuel standard requirements for ethanol in gasoline to say that the mandate was wrong, that it was anti-consumer, that it raised prices for consumers, uh, presumably as a result of raising corn prices. With that, let me turn it over to uh, Mr. Gallimberti, please. You have five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Whitehouse, uh, Ranking Member Grassley, and all the committee members for the kind invitation uh, to be here today. My name is Claudio Gallimberti, and I'm here representing Reistad, a global energy analysis and consulting firm. The global energy industry is at a turning point. A transition is sweeping across many of its sectors. In some areas, like electric vehicles, solar PV, wind, battery, the pace of change has been gaining momentum. In others, commercially competitive alternatives to oil and gas are yet to emerge. The net effect is that we don't know yet how fast and deep the process of energy transition will be. But one thing we know for sure, the change already underway is relentless and it is not going to be business as usual. 15 years ago, the share revolution led to a resurgence in American oil and gas production, helping it play a crucial role in satisfying domestic and global demand for hydrocarbon. This has kept supply steady and as a result, prices in check through geopolitical upheavals, such as the Arab Spring. In 2022, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been perhaps the most powerful illustration of how oil and gas supply routes can be disrupted within a matter of days. Again, U.S. oil and gas has been essential at keeping the market balanced the prices in check. In a similar fashion, when oil, began to display, when oil began to displace coal as the main source of energy in 20th century, technological breakthrough have been slowly but surely integrating renewables and non-fossil fuel sources into the U.S. and global energy systems. Just as coal was displaced by oil and gas, renewables and energy and emerging clean technologies are positioned to take much of the pressure away from fossil fuel in the coming years and decades. The energy transition is once in a life, uh, once in a generation opportunity for the, for the U.S. With strategic moves such as the Inflation Reduction Act with targeted incentive to accelerate the formation of key, key clean tech industries such as hydrogen, CCUS, the U.S. can cement its position as, a, as an energy superpower. Yet, oil and gas demand is not going away in the short and medium term. The capital stock associated with energy consumption takes time to be replaced, while emerging nations aim to grow their per capita energy consumption on the back of their urbanization and industrialization. The U.S. is currently the largest oil and gas producer worldwide, meeting 16% of world oil supply and 20% of natural gas. It is one of the cleanest and cheapest suppliers because U.S. production is in the bottom quartile of upstream carbon intensity globally and in the bottom half in terms of break-even costs. Hence, if we were to divest too quickly from oil and gas, the price of both will increase. Rystad Energy has developed three scenarios, energy transition scenario, using our proprietary modeling. A fast transition, which we call minus sigma, compatible with the 1.6 degree increase in temperature according to the uh, IPCC. A slow transition called plus sigma, compatible with 2.2, and the middle of the ground mean 1.9 degree. Any of this scenario is still achievable. The fast deployment of renewables and EVs in the past five years may lead us to think we are on the fast transition. Yet, extrapolation of trends might fail to grasp supply chain constraint, the need of regulatory tightening to achieve those targets, and the likely tighter cost associated with that transition. Also, China's current stranglehold on some renewable supply chain nodes could be a risk factor if a dramatic reduction in global trade were to occur. By the same token, the current lack of competitive alternative to oil in key demand sectors such as petrochemical, heavy duty, road transportation, aviation may lead us to think that oil is in a slow transition while technological breakthrough could quickly append this assumption. Currently, we think that the mean scenario is perhaps the one with the higher chances of coming to fruition for oil, 
in that case, US Shell will remain a key energy source for the next 10 to 15 years, maintaining today's level of crude production and increase in natural gas. In a slow transition, shale production would need to increase quite dramatically to match global demand. Yet, if a fast transition comes about, then shale production will need to decrease rapidly in response to very low oil prices. In conclusion, committee, the transition is highly uncertain and the output for oil and gas can be dramatically different past 2030s depending on the pace of technological development at take. Thus, now is the time for the US to take a pragmatic approach for energy policy which leverages on the flexibility of shale oil and gas while championing renewables. By doing so, the U.S. can maintain its place as the leader of the energy world. Thank you very much. Next is uh, Dr. Semenyuk. Chairman Whitehouse, Ranking Member Grassley, and members of the Senate Budget Committee, thank you for inviting me to testify. It is an honor to do so. My name is Gregor Semenyuk. I am an assistant research professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I research the economic drivers and consequences of structural change in the energy transition. Recent publications of my team in Nature Energy and Nature Climate Change analyze the macroeconomic and financial risks of global oil and gas asset stranding due to uncertainty about the pace at which energy demand is shifting to low carbon alternatives. The US economy is a major oil and gas producer and therefore exposed to these risks. A key problem is that final investment decisions today have to be made for projects that require returns years into the future. And financial investors must make decisions today about how to value companies based on their ability to deliver shareholder distributions years into the future. The energy transition creates major uncertainty about future fossil fuel demand. Here, I focus on reasons for downside risk that is, demand for fossil fuels that turns out to be lower than was expected at the time of investment. That can lead to the stranding of the invested asset. There are three key reasons for such downside risks to materialize, and uh, that depend on the actions of the whole world, not just those of the United States. First, importers of oil and gas have always had the energy security incentive to wean themselves off the imports of fossil fuels. Thanks to the fast decline in costs of low-carbon alternatives, there is now also an economic incentive to do so. Cost declines and deployment of renewables continue to outpace even bullish projections. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, transition efforts in importing countries have only intensified, with global record investments into renewables in 2022. Thanks to the robust negative correlation between cumulative investment and the price of various renewable technologies, which is called Wright's Law, these efforts will lead to even stronger incentives for a fast transition in a self-reinforcing cycle. That is advantageous for fossil fuel importers, but it creates stranded asset risks for exporters. The second reason is the United States does not produce the lowest cost product in the world. If other lower cost producers expect fossil fuel demand to decline, they are incentivized to attempt to capture as much of the remaining market as they can. They would do this by flooding the market to lower prices. We find that this is the dominant strategy for low cost producers to play, which leaves a diminished market for US producers to export to. We calculate that these two causes of downside risk combined could lead to revenue losses in the US fossil fuel sector of 1.6 trillion US dollars over 15 years. That in turn would spell a GDP loss of 1.8 trillion dollars over 15 years. Both figures are discounted to present values. These losses do not account for medium term lower competitiveness in low carbon sectors if the US economy remains specialized in fossil fuel compatible technologies longer than its competitors. Third, U.S. investors are globally active, thereby exposed to stranded fossil fuel assets, not just in the United States. We calculate that 400 billion U.S. dollars in potentially stranded assets are currently sitting on U.S. balance sheets, a third more than the value of stranded U.S.-based production assets, and 30% of the global total. In light of the interconnectedness of financial markets and herd behavior, such financial risks could have systemic implications. The current undersupply of fossil fuels may suggest that stranded assets are really just an illusion, 
But it is precisely the uncertainty about future demand for their product that makes oil and gas companies more reluctant to proceed with new projects today. Capitalist economies are unrivaled in their ability to supply an expanding market. The same cannot be said of a declining one. Energy security in the short and long run must consider a robust diversification away from relying mainly on fossil fuels whose prices will only become more volatile in a declining global market. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doctor. Our next witness is uh, Mr. Ramey from RFF. Please proceed. Senator Whitehouse, Senator Grassley, distinguished members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today. My name is Daniel Ramey. I am a fellow at Resources for the Future, and I direct our Equity in the Energy Transition Initiative. RFF is an independent, nonprofit research institution. Our mission is to improve environmental, energy, and natural resource decisions through impartial economic analysis and policy engagement. The views expressed here are my own and may differ from those of other RFF experts, its officers, or its directors. RFF does not take positions on specific legislative proposals. As you've heard, the outlook for US oil and gas production is uncertain, but there are hundreds of communities around the United States that depend on the production of oil and gas for jobs and tax revenue. One crucial issue for these communities, and indeed the entire nation, is the volume of government revenue collected from fossil fuels, particularly oil and natural gas. I'd like to state that although I will be describing the risks of government revenue losses from reducing our reliance on fossil fuel, I do not view these risks as justification for delay or inaction on climate change mitigation. On average, from 2015 through 2019, the production and use of fossil fuels generated $138 billion per year in revenue for local, state, tribal, and federal governments. The largest source is the gasoline tax, totaling $49 billion per year for states and $40 billion for the federal government. These revenues fund transportation infrastructure, and they are declining. As fuel economy improves and electric vehicles become more common, they will decline further. By 2050, we estimate that these revenues will fall by $26 billion per year under a business as usual scenario, and by $60 billion per year under a scenario that limits global warming to two degrees Celsius by 2100. One option to replace these declining revenues is a tax on vehicle miles traveled. This approach would more fairly distribute the cost of maintaining our transportation infrastructure. More than a dozen states and the federal government are currently experimenting with pilot programs that tax drivers based on miles driven. In addition, this tax could be adjusted to reflect the weight of each vehicle so that drivers pay for the wear and tear they impose on the roads. The second largest revenue source is from oil and gas production, which generates bonus payments and royalties for the federal government, states, and tribes, severance taxes for states, property taxes for local governments, and several other smaller revenue streams. We estimate that these revenues total $34 billion per year, with $7 billion for the federal government, and $27 billion per year for state and local governments. We estimate that by 2050, these revenues will be $6 billion higher under a business as usual scenario, and $8 billion lower under a two degree scenario. Under a 1.5 degree scenario, oil and gas revenues would be $23 billion lower by 2050 for states and the federal government. Some local governments, states, and native nations are highly dependent on coal, oil, and natural gas to support essential services. In Wyoming, for example, fossil fuels provide more than $7,000 per person in local and state revenue. They represent more than half of all state local revenue in Wyoming. In North Dakota, Alaska, and New Mexico, fossil fuels account for more than 15% of state and local revenue. Native nations, such as the Navajo, Southern Ute, and MHA Nation, are also heavily dependent on fossil fuels to support essential services. Even in states like California, which does not rely on fossil fuels for a large share of its revenue, local communities, such as those in Kern County, depend heavily on oil production to fund local services and education. Transition to a net zero emissions economy will have major implications for these communities and governments at every level. For governments that rely on fossil fuels, investing in economic diversification to develop new sources of revenue will be critical. Another important step would be investing more of today's fossil fuel revenues, which in some places are at all time highs, in permanent funds that provide revenue regardless of what happens to future oil and gas production. For the federal government, the most economically efficient approach to addressing climate change and raising revenue would be through pricing carbon, 
But even without a carbon price, the federal government can play an important role in supporting local communities that rely heavily on fossil fuels. The Federal Interagency Working Group on Energy Communities is starting to play this role, focused on coal communities. Although the challenges faced by coal communities are large and deserve attention, the oil and natural gas industry is a far larger employer and revenue generator, and a downturn in oil and gas demand will have larger impacts on government budgets. We've learned from the coal experience that if we want energy communities to thrive, policy intervention needs to occur well in advance of industry decline. In short, the time to design smart revenue policies and invest in these communities is now. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, sir. And now we turn to Dr. Uh, Zyker. Thank you, Chairman Whitehouse and uh, Ranking Member Grassley. A large shift away from fossil fuels is virtually certain not to occur because fossil fuels overwhelmingly are the most efficient forms of energy now and prospectively. Unconventional energy technologies are far more costly and less reliable. It is only massive subsidies and other policy subventions that allow them to attract investment. Any such shift resulting from market forces would take place over many decades, over many years or decades as part of the long-term process of capital depreciation and investment. There will be no market-driven stranding. Shifts in the values of capital assets are a constant feature of a market economy, in particular resulting from technological advances. There is no principle consistent with support for a market economy that would imply a role for government in response to such shifts. Nor will government policies engender a massive stranding of fossil capital assets. With perhaps one minor exception, Congress has never enacted a statute mandating direct reductions in greenhouse gas emissions because that would require sharp declines in the consumption of fossil fuels that is a substantial increase in energy costs. That would not be consistent with the political interests of elected public officials. IPIC argues that achievement of the purported 1.5 degree safe limit on global temperature increases would require explicit or implicit taxes on fossil fuels equivalent to more than $35 per gallon of gasoline by 2030 in constant year 2022 dollars and rising short, uh, sharply thereafter. No Congress will enact such policies or any others even remotely approximating them. Nor will international policies create a stranding. The Paris Agreement, apart from the reality that the nationally determined contributions are meaningless, necessarily contains no enforcement mechanism, nor could it. The only remaining possibility is a massive regulatory stranding of fossil assets it would not survive judicial review under the major questions doctrine. The energy transition usually is justified on grounds of an asserted climate crisis in support of which there exists no evidence, none, in terms of a comprehensive list of climate phenomena. Instead, the crisis narrative derives entirely from climate models that uh, overstate the mid-tropospheric temperature record by factors of about 2.5 on average. The models are fine-tuned so as to um, deny the importance of natural influences on climate phenomena, but that is inconsistent with a large body of evidence, in particular the sharp warming observed between 1910 and 1945. Almost all of the adverse IPIC predictions are based upon scenarios that IPIC itself describes as low probability, and IPIC itself is deeply dubious about the various catastrophes often asserted as looming large. NASA reports significant planetary greening due to increasing atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide, and data from the United Nations show that global per capita food production has increased sharply since the 1960s. Cold kills far more people than heat. Just as anthropogenic warming might create adverse effects, it also yields beneficial impacts, which are incontrovertible and the two must be weighed against each other. Government policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions would have future climate effects, either trivial or indistinguishable from zero, as predicted by the EPA climate model under assumptions that exaggerate the prospective effects of such policies. The Biden administration net zero policy, just to pick an example, would reduce global temperatures in 2100 by about 17 one hundredths of one degree. That would be barely detectable. Such policies cannot survive any plausible benefit-cost test. That is why the Biden administration 
has substituted calculations of the social cost of carbon, a fatally flawed analytic framework. Let me conclude with a, an admonition. The title of this hearing contains the phrase, in a low carbon world, a blatant attempt to assume the answers to the underlying questions. It is therefore deeply misleading. This committee, I think, would be wise to reorient its focus and assumptions and to begin anew. Thank you very much. And our uh, next witness is Mr. Puliresi. Please proceed for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Whitehouse, Ranking Member Grassley, members of the Budget Committee, uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, uh, explore some of the uh, issues regarding stranded assets and energy transition. Let's go to the first slide, please. So, you know, one of the issues is that the world still runs on fossil fuels. In fact, all the efforts we've made to date on uh, alternative fuels and uh, more, more advanced kinds of fuels have been additive to the world's uh, energy supply. They have not substituted for them. This is data through 2019. You'll see there's a slight flattening off in coal, but I'm sure when we see the 21, 20, 2022 data, uh, we're going to see coal is up, resulting in the uh, uh, large requirements for new gas supplies in Europe causing greater use of coal in Asia. Those supplies have been diverted. Next slide, please. Um, it's very important to understand that the North American production platform is an instrument of national power, wealth creation, and energy security for not only all, all of North America, but for the United States. In fact, if you look at this data on this slide, between 2010 and 2020, the United States alone provided over 80% of the increment in, increment in world demand for oil. And it was that increment of production out of the United States that helped to moderate gasoline prices. Next slide, please. Um, there's a lot of discussion about stranded assets, and we can see here from the various index funds that since uh, 2022, uh, investors have uh, been flooding into traditional fossil fuel companies, particularly oil and gas. In addition, if we look at the long bond market uh, for investment grade equities, there is no evidence at all that, that investors, perhaps our most conservative investors, view uh, oil and gas as a risky investment. And some of these bond durations go up to 16 years. Next slide. There was some discussion about this issue already, but I do think that these policies that much of the administration has been talking about to halt oil and gas development before we have cost-effective substitutes are both risky and problematical. Actually, this is a fundamental uh, risk towards stranded asset. It's by government behavior. And here you can see that some of the high bids in 2018 on federal lands in New Mexico generated a billion dollars. Nearly $500 million of that was returned to the state of Mexico for use in schools, health care, roads. Somebody is going to have to talk to the officials in New Mexico and let them know that under the administration's proposals, none of these funds will be available. Next slide. OK, let's talk a little bit about some of the modeling. Next slide. Now, you can see here. Uh, the, zero, the zero net uh, assumptions under the International Energy Agency requires essentially between now and 2050 to remove as much energy from the world system as the entire OECD produces today. This is an enormous task. And keep in mind, four pillars of modern civilization, steel, cement, fertilizer, and plastics, have no cost-effective substitute today. These emerging economies throughout the world, particularly in Asia, uh, are uh, planning to grow, their populations are going to expand, and their economies are going to expand, expand, and they're going to need vast quantities of energy. Next slide. Now, <clears throat> one of the, one of the uh, assumptions we're often told or conclusions made is that if we would switch out of fossil fuels, into renewable fuels, we would insulate ourselves from energy security. But as, as you can see here, it is not a given. 
the energy, these renewable fuels require the uh, importation and the production of vast quantities of critical materials, and these are rising in supply now. They face a broad number of uh, energy supply problems. Next slide. In addition, right now, if you can look from this slide here, you can see that the U.S. dominates the world production of oil and gas. It does not dominate the world production of critical materials needed for the transition, and these materials, particularly the processing of them, are entirely dominated by China. And next slide. This is my final slide. Um, even if the entire OECD were to go to net zero by 2050, in the absence of the rest of the world engaging in some dramatic and draconian effort to reduce its use of energy, total carbon emissions in 2050 would only be about 10% less than they would be in a business as usual scenario. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Pulley Racing. Um, let me start um, with Mr. Gallimberti. Uh, for starters, tell me what kind of entities rely on Rystad's expert judgments? Who are some, what, what's your customer base look like? Thank you for your question, Mr. Whitehouse. Uh, the, um, it's uh, governments, uh, it's uh, um, all the energy sector. So for, starting with uh, the um, uh, oil producer, of course, uh, renewables producer. Uh, so it's uh, the entire supply chain of energy. And it's uh, your view that we are at a point that you describe as epochal change. Epochal is a very strong word to use. Could you describe why you use such a word? We think we are. We think it's uh, uh, the, the, the evidence uh, that uh, it's been accumulating on the uh, investment in, uh, in renewables, uh, investment in uh, uh, batteries, uh, in uh, electric vehicles. Let's take the electric vehicle. Uh, the, um, for, for the past uh, 100 years, the uh, transportation, which is uh, half of oil demand, has been dominated by the internal combustion engine. So you see this as a really major shift, equivalent to gasoline engines replacing horse-drawn? It is possible. It is possible, uh, Senator. Th there are some caveats that are very important for us to, to consider. Uh, the first is that so far... Well, let me come back to the caveats, because I just have five minutes, and you can always follow yes. on if, you don't, if I don't get back to you. Because uh, the next part of this was Dr... And by the way, you say the peak could happen in 2025, right? Just a few years ahead. In the 1.6 degree scenario, yes. Yes. Um, when that happens, Dr. Semenyuk, you talk about the systemic implications of stranded asset risk. We've heard the word systemic repeatedly defined in this committee. It's a mild-mannered sounding word, but it means big things, does it not? Uh, yes, indeed. Thank you. Um, financial regulators like to think about the risk around the climate change transition uh, as physical and transition risks, and transition risks are associated with moving away from uh, a fossil fuel-based economy in order to mitigate climate change. Um, these risks uh, have drivers in government policy and technological change that is unanticipated by market participants, and there are various transmission channels, and one of these channels could be a decline in the asset values in the, in the fossil energy sector. So systemic implies that something very big and dangerous might happen. Well, yes. Uh, as we all know, the financial system is interconnected. A few weeks ago, we saw with the uh, Silicon Valley Bank that you know, um, activities by the Federal Reserve have far-reaching um, implications elsewhere in the system that weren't foreseen. And so um, the thing with systemic implications is that you know, if we knew them, we could hedge against them. Uh, that would be priced in the market. But so there is a risk of mispricing, and so, uh, it is hard to predict uh, how that could play out. So let's look, at, let's look at one way it could play out. Um, Mr. Gallimberti has suggested that 2025 could be peak. On the other side of peak, is it likely that participants in the oil market will change their behavior as they see a declining uh, sales outlook? Um, yeah, certainly so. Um, as I um, uh, so elaborated in my... 
it would be prudent to consider that as a, as a distinct possibility. Oh, yeah, definitely. And the scenario could be that, for instance, instead of honoring cartel pricing, Saudi Arabia begins to sell at cost plus and underprice American and other products, correct? That could be conditional on the market actually declining so that there isn't a strain on suppliers to actually meet demand. Exactly. Yeah. And if they do that and the U.S. products are priced out of the market, that can be – the effect in the United States could be much more abrupt than the global effect on fossil fuel market. To the extent that U.S. producers are not able to compete with these prices and that there's a global market for the product that is being sold, yes. And this is not entirely in our control because actors overseas, the EU and Asia, reducing their fossil fuel dependence could provoke that decline and then we'd have to live with it even if we were still buying just as much fossil fuel as ever. Indeed, there are strong economic and energy security incentives for a large part of the global economy to, to try and reduce fossil fuel imports, which are not only more costly to use at some point today uh, in, in, in some applications, but also, um, you know, of course, uh, hurt the current account balance that, that drains uh, foreign currency that could be spent on other things. And just a last question to Mr. Ramey. Um, you've We've heard testimony that the U.S. is particularly vulnerable in the event of this market shift. Your testimony shows that within the U.S. there are certain states that are particularly vulnerable. <clears throat> Could you give some brief um, description of what the economic dangers are within those states if that vulnerability should come to fruition? Yes, Senator, they're, they're substantial. Uh, some of the states I mentioned in my testimony, such as Wyoming and North Dakota, Alaska, parts of Texas, uh, parts of other states, rely heavily on oil and gas extraction to fund public services. Uh, if there is a sharp downturn in demand for oil and gas or prices uh, of oil and gas, then these communities could, for, could face revenue shortfalls, which could lead local and state governments to reduce public services and or raise taxes. That could encourage people to leave the area and leave the state, which would reinforce the negative cycle. So it's a substantial issue. Thanks. Thanks for letting me go on a bit longer, Ranking Member. I turn to you, Senator Grassley. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> quite regularly we preached uh, by corporate elitists that think that we ought to be carbon neutral by some arbitrary dates. And then we see the hypocrisy of how they fly around the world in their private jets, Mr. Dr. Zyker and and then they say they can pay for it because they have the wealth to buy carbon credits. And then they talk about how they want to save the planet and help the working class of America by paying lip service to environmental justice. But no one ever addresses just how harmful their decarbonization dreams would be in practice. So to you, what impact would federally imposed divestment from fossil fuels have on the U.S. economy? Well, we have, we have several estimates in the literature on the cost of um, achieving net zero emissions in the U.S. and, and internationally. Uh, there's my estimate from a few years ago, the cost of the Green New Deal, which is just one variation of a net zero um, policy for the electricity sector alone, my estimate was about $500 billion per year permanently or about $4,000 per U.S. household. Um, the American Action Forum, uh, Doug Holes Aiken, uh, wrote a study. He used to be the, um, the head of the Congressional Budget Office. He used a somewhat different methodology and came up with numbers <clears throat> roughly equal to mine, about $500 billion per year. Let, let me take <coughs> it from those two figures you just gave us and uh, tell the impact that that would have on poor and working class American families. Well, if you look, um, if you look at um, the um, data on um, from the uh, Energy Information Administration about the cost of electricity from renewable sources, wind and solar, uh, solar power versus conventional energy, what you'll see is 
the cost of uh, wind plus gas turbine backup, which you need to, to avoid blackouts, is about four times higher than the cost of natural gas generation. And the, then, to answer your question, the, the question then becomes, what does that do to household budgets? And uh, if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, reports on uh, the percentage of household budgets spent on electric power by income quintile, you'll see that for the lowest income quintile, it's about 9%. For the next quintile, it's, I think, around 6%. And it's a slowly, it's a declining percentage of household budget as you move up the income ladder. So there's no question these policies are really highly regressive <clears throat> unless they are funded by taxpayers through the tax system, in which case we should double the cost amounts at a minimum because of the excess burden or deadweight loss, if you want to call it that, of the tax system. Um, Turner and Lastman did a study of the energy of net zero emissions, not only for the electricity sector, but for the whole economy, electric vehicles, building refits, et cetera. And their estimate is $50,000 a year per household permanently, every year. Uh, this, this is not cheap, and anyone who claims that uh, an energy transition will occur naturally because of a cost advantage on the part of unconventional energy is, I think, being deeply, deeply unrealistic. Okay, let me go to uh, Mr. Pirolisi. Um, you, uh, we all know you got broad background in various departments of government on this whole issue. So, do you expect the world to forego energy security in an effort to reduce greenhouse gases? And will fossil fuel demand collapse? And are you concerned about fossil fuel assets being stranded? So absolutely not, uh, Senator Grassley. Uh, we've had a long-term project with the Institute of Energy Economics in Japan, traveled all through South Asia. And what you, when you meet the local political leaders and energy planners in those countries, they tell you they'd like to buy gas if it were cheaper. But if they can't get it, they're going to get coal. And so. Are, it's, it's so misguided. We, we can put a lot of gas on the water. We can produce a lot more natural gas in this country. And even at the upcoming G7 meetings, you're going to see some disagreement on the role of gas. And unfortunately, I think our, the current administration is sort of opposed to making a strong statement and to promote the use of gas as a form for energy security and cost effectiveness. Senator Johnson. Hey, Mr. Chairman, I just want to ask, do any of the witnesses, do you, do you have a cost estimate of what we've already spent trying to combat climate change? Mr. Pugilis here. Yeah, so we know that um, for the world, the last 20 years, Bloomberg has done an estimate that we've spent about indirect subsidies and not mandates, not feed-in tar tariffs, but just money from governments, $5 trillion dollars. And for solar, wind, and what we call modern biofuels. And the estimate is that is generating about 5% of total primary uh, emissions. Yeah. So, so $5 trillion. Um, we keep hearing that the world's going to end in 12 years if we don't do something now. We've already spent $5 trillion. Mr. Seminick, you raised your hand here. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Um, just to add to this, that the world also spent over $1 trillion in subsidies for the fossil fuel sector in 2022. So it's a question both of gross spending and net spending and also what that leads to in the But future. again, my, my point is, if we've already spent $5 trillion, I mean, you're here and we've held now, this is our fifth or sixth hearing, you know, again, trying to create an alarm over climate change is going to create this calamity. I mean, Mr. Semi, you're, you're talking about stranded assets. That could cost us $400 billion. We've already spent $5 trillion and haven't even moved the mark because uh, the rest of the world is going to continue to do fossil fuels. Mr. Zyker. Yeah, one point I'd like to make in response to uh, Professor Semenyuk's uh, comment. Most of the global subsidies for fossil fuel are consumption subsidies in third world countries designed to uh, maintain social peace. What that tells us is that an effort to make fossil fuels even more expensive will be resisted heavily by most governments around the world, 
precisely for the same reason that they subsidize the consumption of fossil fuels now so heavily. Well, again, if we're, if, again, if we're talking, though, about if it's climate change and what climate change is going to produce in terms of economic calamity, you know, higher insurance costs, you know, I mean, stranded assets, the costs that I've listened to in these five hearings pale, I mean, pale in comparison to what we've already, and I will say wasted, $5 trillion trying to hold back the tides, which we cannot do. I mean, most recent example, uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, this is just in the Wall Street Journal, did their own study in terms of the cost of the green energy subsidies and the Inflation Reduction Act. Now, we were told before we voted on that, it was going to cost about $391 billion, but very similar to the cost, of the, you know, the calamitous cost of stranded assets. Well, we just spent $391 billion that we don't have, mortgaging our kids' future, but Goldman Sachs says, no, it's not $391 billion, it's $1.2 trillion dollars. So again, to me, this calamity is all self-inflicted. And all you have to do is just take a look at the total dollars we're spending, having apparently no impact because everybody keeps predicting things that the world's going to end in 12 years. And by the way, all the predictions that have been ongoing for the last few decades haven't resulted in that, those calamities. They've, they're not true. They've, they've been proven false. But, uh, sir, you raise your hand. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I would uh, just point uh, you and the committee to recent work uh, from Resource for Resources for the Future and other institutions that's been published in peer-reviewed literature, not white papers from think tanks, uh, that looks at the social cost of carbon and finds that, you know, every year in the United States, we are essentially doing $900 billion worth of damage to society uh, through our CO2 emissions. Oh, I'm, so, yeah, I'm, 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 listen, I have greatest respect for peer-reviewed literature. Uh, Mr. Zyker. Yeah, the, the, the social cost of carbon estimates, both from the uh, Obama administration on an interim basis, the interim estimates from the Biden administration, the RFF estimates in Nature, and the forthcoming Biden administration finalized estimates are deeply, deeply, deeply problematic. They're based upon uh, the inclusion of co-benefits of uh, purported reductions in other pollutants already regulated under the Clean Air Act, the inclusion of global benefits, which is a, 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 an improper methodologically uh, procedure, the use of discount rates that are artificially low, that factor alone if one uses a discount rate of 7% as outlined in OMB Circular A4, the social cost of carbon in almost any integrated assessment model goes to almost zero. So let me ask, who's, who are doing these studies? I mean, what kind of government grants are they getting from the agencies that want to prove climate change? Well, Again, this is I, a self-perpetuating... I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't care where the funding comes from. It's irrelevant analytics. They're just, they're just flawed it's just, studies. It, well, the issue is whether the analyses are rigorous intellectually, and the answer is no, they're not. Okay. I've run out of time, but I'm happy to let uh, your witnesses respond to that if they can. I would just uh, encourage, uh, encourage Dr. Zyker to, uh, to engage with the peer-reviewed literature on this stuff that is reviewed by the top experts in the field. Thank you. And if I still may make two points. Uh, first, I'm glad that stranded assets estimates aren't any higher than they are, meaning that a transition is a lot cheaper than the possible cost if there isn't a transition from physical damages. And second, uh, indeed, uh, subsidies in the developing world are uh, done to make fossil fuels affordable. Luckily, renewable energy is now actually cheaper than fossil fuels in many applications and is set to become even more cheaper than fossil fuels, which tend to become more expensive over time as the cheapest reservoirs are depleted. Well, then the economy will take care of it. If it's cheaper, we'll, we'll move investments toward those uh, cheaper Un energy stores. Unless subsidies distort these markets. markets. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Johnson. Well, let's uh, talk for a minute about um, subsidies that might distort these markets. Um, it seems to me that uh, it's fairly elementary economics um, that the negative externalities from a product ought to be included in the price of the product in order for the proper market decisions to be made. I think um, 
That's basically Milton Friedman, Econ 101. Does anybody disagree with that proposition? Okay, no, no evident disagreement. So um, if, and let's just go back, Neg the most famous negative externality is, of course, pollution, is it not? Across the economic literature? Are, are you including the negative externalities, Senator, uh, attendant upon renewable, renewable, unconventional energy? I'm asking the general economic question, yeah. whether we all agree, which we seem to, that negative externality is under basic market theory, ought to be included in the price of the product so the market can work correctly. And if that's true, then if there are negative externalities that are not baked into the price of the product, it would seem to me that that would count as a subsidy. In fact, economists regularly refer to those socialized negative externalities as subsidies. That's a fairly standard proposition in economic literature, isn't it? Mr. Ramey? Just minor distinction, you know, typically I think we would refer to unpriced externalities on, as an indirect subsidy, yeah. whereas a tax credit or a grant would be a direct subsidy. Yeah, but a subsidy nonetheless. Yes. And that's widely accepted as a, uh, the appropriate terminology in the e economic literature, correct? In environmental economics, the field that I know, yes. Yeah. Dr. Simeone. And if I may add, the International Monetary Fund, um, to put this into perspective, estimates about one trillion or, or even less in direct subsidies. In 22, they were above one trillion. But these indirect subsidies amount to five trillion dollars. And I just want to add that our estimates about economic competitiveness do not take into account these indirect subsidies because, as you say, they aren't priced. Yeah, in fact, I was going to raise that International Monetary Fund um, number myself. Uh, the most recent one that I have seen from the International Monetary Fund for uh, indirect subsidy of fossil fuel just in the United States is $660 billion every year. That is a very, very big subsidy for renewals to have to climb uphill against. Is that part of Dr. Semyonyuk, is that the U.S. part of the number, the $5 trillion number you're referring to? Yes. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, do you want to, I'm kind of, okay. Well, let me ask, I'd like to ask a series of questions of Mr. Zeichel, if you'd stand by for a moment. Um, first of all, you seem to be agreeing that negative externalities under economic theory ought to be into price and that when they're not, that's an indirect subsidy of the product whose negative externalities are not priced. Is that a correct statement? Yes, that's correct. Um, now, reviewing your testimony, I, I'm a little bit, just a little bit confused by it and I'd like to go through um, some of the propositions. You seem to be saying on occasions that the earth just isn't warming, that in 2015. That's not, that's not what I said at all. Uh, well, you have a exhibit that says there are no significant trends in warming. You then separately say that, rough, that there is, in fact, a 1.1 degree increase since 1880, and that roughly half of it is uh, produced by anthropogenic sources, which I presume you mean fossil fuel combustion? Well, large, much of it is fossil fuel combustion, not all of it. Anthropogenic, you say anth roughly anthropogenic half. Anthropogenic sources are man-made. Natural variability is not. And you think that half of the 1.1% increase the, the, that we've seen is anthropogenic? The available evidence in anthropogenic. the literature suggests that about half of the 1.1 degree temperature increase since 1850 is anthropogenic. Yes, that's correct. And of the anthropogenic, it's essentially all carbon combustion. Well, it, no, it's not all. It's essentially some all. of it is agriculture. Some of it is cement production. Uh, it's anthropogenic in the form of the emissions of greenhouse gases. It's not all. Uh, okay, fossil. I'll take that. 
emission of greenhouse gases, not just pure right. uh, CO2 combustion. Right. So as recently as 2020, you've said there's no consensus among scientists about climate science. Is that a proposition you will stand by here today? About climate science? Yep. I don't even understand what, I didn't say that. Uh, actually, you did, and we'll get that information to you, but no point well, quarreling. Where, where, no. where in my statement do you see that? No, this is in 2020. It was in a document called A Critique of the House Republican Climate Policy Proposals. There's no consensus on, on the equilibrium climate sensitivity of the climate system. In other words, if you emit another ton of greenhouse gases, what is the effect on temperatures after the climate system adjust fully. There's no consensus. So saying that, that one additional aliquot of carbon dioxide can't predict precisely no, we, a degree we, we of do temperature not know. increase. We do not That's a different know. thing than saying that there's no consensus among scientists about climate science. Would you concede well, that you may have overstated the proposition? I, I, I would have to see what I said. Okay. Senator. Well, let's move on then because we don't have that in front of us. Fine. Um, in 2019, when President Trump said that global warming is a hoax, you said there is very substantial truth in that statement. What did you mean by saying that well, there is very substantial truth know, in President Trump's statement? I would Trump be the first to agree hoax? that the pre precise use of language is not among Mr. Trump's political habits and mannerisms. What he actually said was a lot of it is a hoax. Now, the argument that... Is a lot of it a hoax? A lot of it is a hoax. Well, I don't know what a lot of it means. Well, you're the one who I, said I, sub I, very substantial. Pardon me? You're the one who used the words very substantial. Well, the argument is that, that a there's a crisis looming is a hoax. The argument that the, a U.S. net zero policy will make an appreciable difference is a hoax. There are lots of hoaxes in this debate. It All does right. not mean the anthropogenic warming itself is a hoax. It certainly is not. Um, you said in 2015 that since the implementation of the Kyoto Protocol, the satellite temperature record essentially has been flat. Now you say 1.1 degrees since 1880, and half of it is greenhouse gas emissions, correct? Well, the, the satellite record begins in 1979, not, not 1880, Senator. Um, you used the term 1880. Well, that's the surface temperature record, not the satellite record. The satellite record begins in 1979, and then the question is, how do you interpret the changes in mid-tropospheric temperatures over the last 40 years? That's much more difficult, uh, but there certainly has... There it was your intention in 2015 to convey the notion that global warming was not happening because the satellite temperature record was flat, right? What other point would you have been making? No, there was a hiatus after the, uh, there was a hiatus after the El Nino of 1998. Gotcha. Ending to something like 2014 or something. I have to go back okay. and look. So you meant that the during there mean, was. That does not mean, Senator, that climate change or anthropogenic climate change, quote, is not happening. There are anthropogenic effects. There's natural variability. We don't understand the relationships between the two, and to say that the temperature is not changing over some short period of time does not mean that there is no anthropogenic warming. Of course, I will agree is. with you on that very point. Thank you. I think that's uh, wisely stated. Um, and you concede that the 10 warmest years in the historical record have all occurred since 2010. No, that's certainly not correct. Ah. That is certainly not correct. Uh, the, the argument that you see in the literature, especially um, from the, uh, in the uh, National Climate Assessment, that there's been a, an increase in extreme temperatures. So this, this graph yeah. is not correct? No, it is correct. And are not the top 10 temperature years all up well, here I in the last, really, I can't really, the last 10? I'm not sure which, I'm not sure what the base period is. I can't really read that chart very well. What's well, you really, should know it reasonably well because it's actually in your testimony. Yeah, that's right. Well, I, I'm not right? sure if it's the same one. I have one very similar to it. It may be the And same does one. your one very similar to it also show that the top 10 years, the top 10 heat years, uh, top, I'm sorry, what? The 10 warmest years on the historical record have all occurred since 2010. 
I, I don't Your graph I, and this graph both show the same temperatures, correct? Yeah, I'm not sure. I have to go okay. look. Um, well, let me go on a little bit just to some of the things that you've said. Yeah. Um, has the climate industry evolved into a totalitarian ideology? Well, climate policy has evolved into a totalitarian ideology, controlling how people move, controlling the type of heaters they use, controlling the type of stoves they use, controlling the, uh, the characteristics of the and homes they you, live in. You draw an equivalence in the statement that you said uh, the climate industry evolved into a totalitarian ideology, is your quote. Um, and you make a reference uh, in that quote, uh, in that uh, passage, also to Benito Mussolini. What is the point of making a reference to Benito Mussolini in the context of the discussing yeah, what you call I, the climate was, industry? You know, Mussolini's quote was that everything within the state, everything by the state, everything for the state, and we have arrived not far from a position in which everything is climate, everything is part of climate, and everything is, is driven by climate. All right. So it really is, I think, uh, a certain... There is a certain totalitarian flavor at a minimum. And to add uh, to that, you've also compared environmentalist views uh, as strangely reminiscent of Joseph Stalin's view mm -hmm. of the difference between one death and mil millions. What is your point in trying to compare environmentalists the, the, and Joseph Stalin? The environmental left has made no secret of its lack of caring about the deaths of many millions of people in the third world as a result of energy shortages and all the rest. They've is been that quite explicit you, about that. Is that why you say environmentalists hate humanity? Yeah, I, I do actually, yes, that is why I say that. Okay. Um, or left-wing environmentalists, I wouldn't, I don't know that. Well, I'm let's sure. talk about a non-left-wing environmentalist who's on this committee, Senator Graham. He, um, suggested that Republicans should put together their own environmental plan mm. uh, as an alternative to the Green New Deal. You responded that uh, he was embracing an anti-human world view mm. and that the mere endorsement of a climate policy implies an endorsement of the climate crisis view. Was it your intention to those compare are, are, Senator Graham are, with those an anti-human? Those are two separate statements, uh, Senator. If fossil fuels are evil, then the factors that increase the demand for fossil fuels are also evil. Among them, prominently, are investments in human capital, health care, training, education, all the rest. If you really believe that fossil fuels are evil, then investments in human capital are also evil, and therefore, well, I don't the, think I've said that fossil fuels I didn't say that you are said evil, that, but Senator. you have said that it's an anti-human world view. Yeah, and I'm I'm explaining why that is true. Okay. Okay. And what and was you're, the second, what was you're the saying that Senator Graham is uh, embracing that that anti-human world view by agreeing to uh, work or try to develop a climate policy? No. What uh, what I said about Republicans endorsing climate policies is that if, in fact, they endorse climate policies, then they implicitly or explicitly are endorsing the climate crisis narrative for which there's no evidence. And once you adopt that stance, there is no principle to defend against the most extreme policy proposals. I never used or thought that Senator Graham was anti-human in any sense. Well, that's good, because he and I are friends, and I don't think he is either. Um, before you became, uh, Senator Lujan is here, let me, are you ready to go, sir, or shall I? Okay, I'll, um, before you uh, began to offer testimony in the er arena of climate change, you were often uh, consulted and offered reports and so forth um, by the tobacco industry, is that correct? No, that's simply not correct. No, nope. you were not part of the Tobacco Institute's stable of no. consultants? No, Senator. Uh, the late Professor Bob Tollison, for two or three years running, received small grants from the Tobacco Institute to organize sessions at the Western Economic Association annual meetings on the topic of, on the general topic of whether or not tobacco taxes are efficient economically. 
Well, I'll so tell you what I will well, do. Well, Senator, if you would let Senator me Lujan answer your is question, I would appreciate it. The question was quite simple. Did you, were you paid by uh, tobacco industry organizations um, or organized by them to provide testimony at the Tobacco Institute? Each year for about two or three years, yes. Okay. Well, here's what I will do because Senator Lujan is ready to go. I will um, review what I consider to be multiple occasions upon which you spoke for the tobacco industry against the regulation or taxation of cigarettes. Well, and I'll give you the chance in writing yeah. to uh, relate what your role was on all those various I just occasions. Told, I just told you what the role was. Yeah, and I'll give you the chance to put that in writing. Very good. Senator Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to Ranking Member Grassley for this hearing and to all the panelists who are, who are here today. Um, much of the written testimony for this hearing focuses on the financial risks and stranded assets. These financial risks are real and need to be managed, but I want to focus in another area. Um, I would like to highlight for the witnesses and for my fellow committee members of another type of stranded risks in the area of stranded communities or livelihoods loss or job opportunities as well. And Mr. Amy, your testimony states that communities with stranded assets might need a decade or more of support to recover. What types of programs will support these communities and local governments for the decade it will take for them to recover? Thank you, Senator. In the short to medium term, I think it's likely that these communities will need support either from their state governments or from the federal government to provide essential services, including education, public safety, roads, uh, other essential services. In the long term, I think the goal for many of these communities will be to build economic resilience over time. And frankly, the solutions to building economic resilience are complex and they vary enormously from community to community. My hope uh, is that the federal government can support the priorities of local stakeholders uh, and local community leaders to pursue the economic resilience strategies that they think will be most promising for their communities. In the conclusions of your testimony, you emphasize the urgency of the clean energy transition and the importance of providing support to state and local governments. But your testimony does not go as far as suggesting how much support for how long and in what form. Does the federal government have an obligation to provide support to state and local governments to replace revenue lost in the transition to clean energy? I think ultimately that'll, that'll be a question for you and your colleagues to decide. RFF does not make specific policy recommendations on these types of issues. Um, we do provide evidence and research uh, to support your decision making. And uh, what I would say is that if there is federal government policy that leads to stranded assets or reduced revenue for local governments, it seems logical to me that the federal government would help those communities manage those negative impacts. I appreciate that. And one area, Mr. Chairman, that we've been able to do some work in an area that was completely ignored, which was included in the bipartisan infrastructure package, was to uh, plug abandoned and orphaned oil and gas wells, for example, an area where neglect throughout the country, um, including families where there were um, maybe one generation to the next an inheritance, uh, while was that, that was not in production, that was completely abandoned, left there. And, you know, if any of you have been to these, um, the, the last time that I traveled to some orphaned oil and gas wells, there were some cattle grazing near a couple of them. Um, no investment had been made in the structures themselves. There was leaking oil all around um, the, the area that I went in. As a matter of fact, there's a, for those of you that are familiar, there's a collection to the tank that is a pipe that comes out and there's a, a bucket that will capture whatever is coming out of it. Well, there, there were no trucks going in. There were cows out there and they were drinking from that bucket, a bucket that had a couple inches of residue on top of the water. Um, and, and so I'm very proud that we were able to work in a bipartisan way to go out and do some of this additional cleanup. And Mr. Amy, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get at is opportunities, job creation, looking at areas where there's been neglect in New Mexico for right now, while 
we're not the number one oil or gas producer in the country. New Mexico has been an energy producer for some years, but we have the largest methane pl uh, plumes in the country. It makes zero sense to me. Um, if we're not the, the largest, why don't the largest have them? What um, investments have been made to stop that, for example? That's a job creator. As a matter of fact, um, one of the times I went out, there was some technology made available to us where we could see methane plumes. Um, you can always smell it, but this would allow us to see it. And when I was looking at this stuff, you could see it for as far as... Dr. Zeicher, what's your finish there, sir? I, I'm sorry. I wasn't calling on you. I was just, I didn't want to get in the way of your conversation. Um, is what, what could happen from the perspective of uh, not controlling when we saw this, this space, but having more technology to stop those leaks, plug those leaks, creating opportunity in places like New Mexico is just another area. As there's more investments and decisions being made, um, we're seeing something finally being embraced by the industry in New Mexico. Um, when you see the largest um, producers in the country now and around the world embracing renewable deployments and changing where they're putting their money, I, I, I certainly hope that everyone else will catch up with what we can be doing in that space. So that's what I was trying to get at. I'm sorry for going over my time, um, Mr. Chairman, but uh, I really appreciate everyone being here um, and for us to be able to have this conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks very much. Um, I'm getting ready to conclude, but let me just ask uh, Dr. Zeichel one last question about um, his tobacco work. Um, there's a report in 1990 um, in which you are cited to have said that various proposals for regulation or taxation of cigarettes are a figurative gold mine for those interested in a display of moral posturing. Is there another motive that is possible for regulation or taxation of cigarettes than mere display of moral posturing? Is there another motive possible? Sure, there are lots of possible motives. Like public health? Like people not dying of cigarette-caused uh, cancer? That's a private health, not a public health issue, Senator. Lung cancer or emphysema are not, contagious, are not contagious. So if something's not, okay. That's an interesting definition of public health. Um, let me conclude by referring back to um, the uh, previous uh, Republican-invited witness, Jessica Weinkel, who said that it was very important in evaluating the uh, testimony and research that is uh, prepared to understand um, the funding behind uh, organizations. And if we could just take a quick look at uh, AEI um, through 2020, AEI has received more than $4.4 million just from oil and gas giant ExxonMobil, the most that any think tank recipient of funds from Exxon has ever received. At the same time, AEI also received over $28 million from Donors Trust and Donor Capital Fund, two organizations that I talk about quite regularly because they have essentially no role other than to obscure the identity of donors. They are an identity laundering mechanism referred to as the dark money ATM of the conservative movement. In addition, nearly $15 million from the SCAFE Foundation, over $2.2 million from Koch Family Foundations, and hundreds of thousands from the American Petroleum Institute, which it's a little on the nose to actually give directly when you could run it through Donors Trust, but there they are. So um, I will ask uh, in a question for the record, and Dr. Zeichel, you can answer this how you wish. I know you say that your testimony here is not endorsed by the American Enterprise Institute, but I will ask for any information that you have related to the uh, continued fossil fuel funding
of your work at AEI, and we'll do that in a question for the record, so you have all the time in the world to answer it carefully. Well, could I make uh, two points about that now? Fire away. First, uh, I'm not involved in fundraising at AEI. I have no idea where AEI's funding comes from, uh, and uh, it has no effect on my work. Second, you know, really, Senator, your not very subtle effort to imply that anyone who disagrees with you is little more than a prostitute is really rather shameful. Hmm. And I would urge you to abandon it. If you f have found an error of either fact or analysis in my work, I'd love to hear it. And complaining about where AI does or does not get its funding over some time period really has nothing to do with the substance of the issues. And uh, I would urge you to abandon that, uh, that, that line of thinking. But I will respond to your written question. That would be great. As and I, I would point out to you that sitting here, as an elected official in Congress trying to find ways to deal with the climate problem, I see the malevolent force of the fossil fuel industry through its politics and through its dark money everywhere. It is the reason that since Citizens United, we have made really no bipartisan progress on any significant piece of climate legislation, when in the years before Citizens United, there was abundant bipartisan effort on climate legislation. The before and after is clear. I think the cause, which is abundant fossil fuel money pouring into politics to buy compliance with their narrative, is exactly the reason that uh, we are in the bad state we are here today. So um, whatever AEI and other fossil fuel funded organizations might mean to you, they mean quite a lot to me because I see their handiwork in this building all the time. With that, the hearing is concluded. The uh, record will be open for until noon tomorrow for any questions that any member may have. I would ask that all the witnesses, if you have a response to a question that comes in, please get it back in a week. And uh, I thank everyone for a particularly interesting hearing.